Good day. I am Brandon, and I am your host of my new channel, Man in the Fire. I hope everyone will be kind and charitable to me. I have never done something like this before. <clears throat> I'm generally very nervous about putting myself out there for rebuke. Uh, and this is me stepping into the light. I'm very excited to do this. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do in my video today is I'm going to be putting forward my thesis that the Protestant canon of scripture cannot be substantiated without leading to some really interesting inevitable conclusions that lead you away from Protestantism itself. I'm going to lead with my opening statement, uh, run through some common arguments that I've engaged in over the past year with uh, people from different, different areas, uh, mostly from the Facebook uh, group somewhat civil Christian debates <clears throat> um, and then once I go through those common objections I'll be talking about really what the inevitable conclusions are and then why it's so important and how it really does disprove all of Protestantism it's a bold claim and I'm really excited to uh, to go down this and open up live debate after I'm finished with all of this for for people so, beginning with my opening statement, it is impossible to prove that the 66 book canon of scripture which Protestants use as their Bible, <clears throat> all attempts end up with one, a logical contradiction, two, an appeal to superstitious belief, three, demonstrably false historical claims, four, bad or insufficient logical conclusions, or finally five, an appeal to Catholic divine magisterial authority, which permeates all time, including today. So once I open up for debate, that's going to be the point I am defending that all Protestant arguments for the canon fall into one of those five criteria, and what their conclusions logically would be following them all the way. So beginning with some common arguments over the past year I've engaged in. The first is that the Protestant 66 book, Canon of Scripture, was known basically just by the early church and accepted by everyone, or at least by the majority of Christians. Um, it was just commonly known and understood by all. So this is pretty easily shown to be historically false, so it violates point three of my argument. Uh, Eusebius, a 4th century church historian, uh, wrote list of what were accepted, de disputed, or rejected books for the canon of scripture. And in his works, he notes that even by the mid 380 centuries after Christ, <clears throat> there were still many books that are included in, in today's New Testament that were highly disputed. Books such as Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation were all still disputed. That's 7 out of the 27 books. So some of the arguments I see from this, it was commonly accepted by all um, track, it, it really shows that it wasn't commonly accepted. Some people will try to spin off of that a little bit, and they'll try to argue that, well, there were onesies and twosie churches, they didn't, you know, always have it right, but on the whole, mo most of the churches had it. But seven out of the 27 books, for centuries, still being listed by a church historian at the time as being highly disputed. I will say there is no evidence to support the argument that onesie and twosie churches were the only ones that were having this dispute. Eusebius here was listing church-wide disputes over the canon of scripture for almost 350 years after Christ. The second argument is what I call is the common metrics argument. Uh, a lot of people try to argue this using a little bit different verbiage sometimes, so I'll try to represent what they're saying even if my words are a little bit different from theirs. So the common metrics is basically that in the scriptures, there is some series of criteria or variable or metric that shows that, yes, this is scripture, and that when we apply it to other writings, those are not scripture. Now, I have asked numerous times for what this criteria is, and occasionally someone will attempt to give me a set of criteria, 
Um, most of the time I don't get it, so I would love when we get to the debate section for someone to offer me <clears throat> a set of criteria because I would love to test this to not only the scriptures themselves to see if they fit in your criteria, but if, if it would exclude other books as well. Because I will argue that there is no set of objective criteria that will land us on this exact same 27 book New Testament canon, much less the Old Testament canon, which that's a whole other discussion. I'm mostly focusing on the New Testament, which makes up the Bible. Uh, this common metrics really does violate uh, the logical conclusion, so rule one, that I've established, <clears throat> because all of these metrics you try to pose end up somewhere else. One of the most common arguments I hear uh, for this has to do with the apostles. People will say things along the lines of, well, you know, it, they were written by the apostles. And then I point out Mark and Luke, the author of Hebrews, who was unknown, Jude, as not being apostles. So then they'll extend it to being, okay, well, someone associated to the apostles. But if that's the criteria, then we can start including new people, such as first letter of Clement, or Ignatius, or the epistles of Polycarp. All of they were very closely attached to the apostles. They were direct disciples of them, and they wrote in the first and second centuries. And there's no reason why they were disputed. No, no historical sources show that they were Gnostic writings or that they were false or anything. So the common metrics argument really falls apart in the fact that it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So I'm going to list that one under the logical contradictions. The next one I, I commonly hear is, not commonly, I hear this sometimes, and I feel like this is probably one of the most honest answers I get, even though it violates point number five and number two, it's, I'm sorry, it violates point number four, insufficient conclusions, and point number two of superstitious belief. If some people will, will try to quote Christ and say, the sheep hear my voice, and they'll use this as an indicator that I can read the scriptures and I just, I know it's Christ talking. I know it's the word of God. I, sheep hear his voice. This is really closely tied to the next argument of immutable characteristics. So rather than this objective common metrics that I talked about previously, these are immutable characteristics, um, things that we can't really grasp or distinguish, but when we look at the text, we can tell. Um, we don't know how to label it, but we know that this is scripture. So the problem with these arguments is one, they're extremely subjective. Um, the Mormons and the Muslims would probably use the same type of argument. The Muslims and Mormons love to try to say, you know, the burning of the bosom, or you can feel it, you just know this is the truth. So it's really indistinguishable from pagans at this point. Uh, the second is that your, your logical conclusion that follows from here is now going to be really bad. You're going to suggest, by logically following your argument to its natural conclusion, that no one was able to distinguish these characteristics for almost 400 years, and that no one heard his voice and could recognize his scriptures for almost 400 years after Christ. The first instance we ever get of someone approaching the Protestant canon of scripture was St. Jerome, which is interesting because St. Jerome multiple times throughout his life actually used the 73 book canon of scripture as divinely authoritative and <clears throat> went in for a while with a 66 book because he rejected certain deuterocanons but then ultimately reverted back so your best argument you would have for the first half millennia of christianity starting here is that there's one guy who could either pick up on the immutable characteristics or you know, the sheep heard his voice. This one lone sheep in 400 years heard the voice of Christ and was able to discern the scriptures, but then immediately stopped and immediately lost the immutable characteristics or immediately stopped hearing his voice because he changed his mind and did end up recognizing them. So that becomes awkward. Going even further, though, what you're continuing to insinuate by this logical argument is that, well, another thousand years passed and no one heard his voice, no one could distinguish these immutable characteristics until the 16th century with Martin Luther, this monk. And then suddenly, after 1,500 years, with only two people, one being temporary, with only two people ever hearing his voice, suddenly entire churches, entire groups of people were getting it. 
Now that's some really interesting hidden Holy Spirit working, not in the light. Um, and if that's the logical conclusion you want to follow, I will happily discuss how the apostles failed in their mission. If Christ commissioned the apostles to go out and preach the word, and then it took 1,500 years and only two people were able to hear in that entire time, the apostles failed Christ. The church failed. The gates of hell prevailed for 1,500 years, if that's the case. And that sounds a lot like what the Mormons argue as well with the great apostasy. But moving on from there, <clears throat> the I'm going to add this one in. I've heard it previously. I haven't come across this argument as of late, but I think it'd be worth adding in. Some people will try to point to some different historical sources, um, namely the Muratorian Fragment. Uh, it's really interesting when they list this one, probably because, if I had to guess, they did a really fast Google search of earliest Christian canon to try and disprove me, and they saw the Muratorian Fragment pop up, and they just copied and pasted it into the argument sections. Uh, without ever looking at what the Muratorian Fragment's canon of scripture actually was. That canon of scripture was not the Protestant 66 book Bible. It had books included in it that they don't use, and it was missing numerous New Testament books that they do use. So that doesn't just make any sense at all. I will say, I have not found, I have yet to find a single source besides the one-off instance of Jerome, temporarily, because he changed his mind, for 1,500 years of the Protestant 66 canon of scripture. No council, no document, no church father, nothing from anybody for 1,500 years showing where this comes from. So these are the most common arguments I've seen. And I'm really going to say, in the debate section, I will gladly engage in any other type of argument someone wants to try to throw. Because anything they have, I am confident at this point, to the point I'm making a live video, <clears throat> that it's going to fall into one of those conclusions. Now, as for my fifth point, what happens if someone just accepts it? What if a Protestant says, you know what, Brandon? I'm going to accept the Catholic Council's New Testament authority. I'm going to say, sure, you know what? They were guided by the Holy Spirit, and they did give us this canon of Scripture. Uh, that goes one of two ways I've seen. The first is people will try to say that they get it from the Council, and the Council was right, in as much as the New Testament, but not the Old Testament. So they will hold to a 66-book Bible, and they'll say, oh, I got my New Testament from the Council of Rome, or the Council of Hippo, in the 4th century. Um, but they were wrong about the Old Testament. They just added those in there they shouldn't have. The other, the other example is they just accept all 73 as canon. Um, we'll get to that one next. But for now, I want to talk about why you cause God to be a God of confusion if you make this argument. Imagine being at Pentecost, and... At the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends like tongues of fire upon the apostles, and they go out on the balcony and they begin preaching to the crowds, right? We, we see this happening in Acts of the Apostles. You have <clears throat> Peter, John, James, you know, Tim, Timothy, all, the, all these guys in order. Um, you have John sitting here on the left, and he's preaching something divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, um, saying, saying something awesome. Uh, on the next side of him, you have James, who had just received the Holy Spirit. They're all there together in the room. Uh, and he starts saying things that are just wrong, just, just false. Not, not lies, but they're just inaccurate. They're just wrong. He's incorrect. How is the Holy Spirit able to divinely inspire, divinely guide something to have truth and falsity at the exact same moment? Because that is what you are arguing logically when you try to affirm that a council, like the Council of Hippo or the Council of Rome, adhered to the Holy Spirit, was guided, and was able to be wrong at the exact same moment. <clears throat> if you argue that, one, that's just logically inconclusive of the Holy Spirit. You're, just, you're saying the Holy Spirit's contradicting itself, which is impossible for God. Or two, you're now throwing every single piece of Scripture into question. Because if it's possible for the Holy Spirit to rightly and wrongly guide people in determining the scripture at the same moment, what's to stop the spirit from rightly and wrongly guiding the authors as they write? You could now have error that's not divinely inspired or divinely inspired to be wrong 
in every single piece of scripture in the Bible. And that opens a whole set of floodgates that I don't think anyone is willing to accept. The next argument is, what, what if someone just says, fine, Brandon, I cave. Like, <clears throat> good points, or maybe don't like my points, I don't know. Um, and I'll accept all 73 books of scripture. I'm a Protestant. I believe in the Protestant faith and church. Um, and you know what? Council of Rome, Council of Hippo, they got it right. They, they were divinely guided. They were inspired, and they were on point. Um, cool story, bro. I'm still a Protestant. May, maybe that's what the case you want to make, and some people have tried that. So here's where I'm going to get to the crux of the whole thing and why that will not stand up under scrutiny and cause the whole deck of cards to fall for Protestantism. What you are now arguing for is akin to the Mormon belief of the great apostasy, but the Protestant version of a partial apostasy. The majority of the Protestant beliefs are based around a lot of just rejecting of Catholic teachings. Things such as the authority of the magisterium, papal authority, the existence of a pope in general, you know, veneration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, intercession of the saints, purgatory, all these great grand things. Well, if you were trying to say that the Holy Spirit did guide the church in a council <clears throat> as a magisterial authority in the 4th century, but you want to reject all of these other teachings, that's going to get really wild really fast. Because we see, even by the end of the 4th century, the majority of these very Catholic teachings were really well in place already by the early church fathers. You will see prayers to Mary. You will see the authority of a magisterium. You will see an authority of the Pope. You know, if you don't see infallible authority of the papacy like Catholics do, you're at least going to see a primacy like the Orthodox do. So e either way, you're getting a Pope, no matter what, who has authority. You will see authority of the bishops. You will see purgatory. All of these things in the early church fathers. <clears throat> But if you don't want to say that all of this was guided by the Holy Spirit, now what you have to do is say, okay, at the end of the time of the apostles, when John finally passed as last surviving apostle, you know, the, these Christians immediately started falling into heresy. Like, they had to be corrected in the first century, there are no divinely inspired apostles to guide them anymore, and they just fell off the wagon. They accepted all these crazy beliefs, couldn't get anything right, couldn't get the canon right because it was highly disputed. Um, and now come the end of the 4th century, so we're like 350-ish years later, Holy Spirit shows back up on scene, guides the church to a canon of scripture, and then immediately backs back out and lets them go straight back into all these error teachings. That would be a wild assertion for anyone to make. That would be directly contradictory to the teachings of Christ where he promised the Holy Spirit to come guide his church. This would be the apostles failing in the Great Commission to go and preach the good news. They would have failed as the church falls into error and is only corrected at a single instance in time for the 1500 years until the Protestant you know, Reformation. And, and that really just doesn't follow, follow whatsoever. If you want to remain logically consistent and have the Holy Spirit guiding the church in this council, you're going to have to accept that the Holy Spirit was guiding the church for, at a minimum, those 400 years, unless you want to argue some great apostasy like the Mormons do uh, after the 4th century into the 5th. And, and, that's, and that's really what the undercutter to Protestantism itself is, is you're going to have to eventually, there's no criteria in the world, there's no early acceptance, no immutable characteristics, you're going to have to accept, eventually, that it requires the guidance of the Holy Spirit to the church to get the Bible, and that there is no reasonable explanation for why the Holy Spirit would not continue to guide this exact same church in the 100,000 other councils that continue to happen for the rest of time. This is why, if you want to accept the New Testament as divinely inspired and as accurate and as correct, inevitably you are going to have to go down that rabbit hole and accept the one holy catholic and apostolic church so yeah um after this i will be opening up for debate i hope that everyone enjoys seeing this um it'll be a live debate i'll be publishing that separate i guess because i don't really know how to do all of these technical things per se just yet uh who knows maybe this will be the start of the next great youtube channel or maybe this will be the last video i ever make I have no idea. We're, we're trying things out. 
um so thank you all for watching